In this video, we're going to be continuing the board bring up of this TetBred PCB I designed featuring a Silinx Zinc system on chip. So system on chip in this case means essentially half application processing unit, APU, which can run embedded Linux and half an FPGA, all contained in this central IC here. In the previous video, we did basic board bring up. So checking the voltage rails, checking for shorts, looking at the oscillators and so on. We also tested that we can program via the JDAC header on the top right of this board how to flash the FTDI chip to the right of the Zinc IC, which is a USB to UART and USB to JTAG converter, which allows us to communicate with the Zinc as well as program it, rather than using this JTAG header at the top right with an additional JTAG programmer. Before we can move on to running larger programs on the Zinc, we have to get our memory interfaces sorted. And in particular, and in this video, we're gonna be looking at the DDR3 memory interface between the Zinc and those DDR chips you're seeing on the left-hand side. This is important because the Silent Zinc itself has very limited on-chip memory, or OCM for short. Anything more than that, for example, if you want to implement gigabit ethernet or even run Linux on this, of course, we'll need some external RAM. And this is what we need to configure in this video. I'll guide you through how I routed this because this will be important in the Vivado setup. Then we'll check out the data sheets of these DDR3 memory ICs because we have to import or enter some very important timing information to Vivado that the Zinc can be configured correctly, that we can actually talk between these ICs. In future videos, then we will check out the QSBI, how it can boot from non-volatile memory. I'll show you the Gigabit Ethernet and also how to run Peta Linux, which is Silinx embedded Linux distribution on the Silinx Zinc. So pretty cool stuff. And I think this video will be quite interesting as well. If you haven't already, I strongly encourage you before you continue with this video is to check out part one if this FPGA system on chip board bring up tutorial, and that is video number 96 on my channel. That will guide you through the absolute basics and getting a basic UART system running and how we can program this device. Thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. The separate PCB I designed completely in Altium Designer, and I'll show you some of the Altium Designer tools in this video, how I rooted out the DDR3 and how Altium Designer helped me do that. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, make sure to check out the link in the description below or go to altium.com forward slash YT forward slash Phil's lab to get yourself an Altium Designer free trial where you can check out the cool Altium 365 features and get 25% off your first license purchase. Let's go through the schematic and hardware design first because we'll need to understand this a tiny bit before we can move over to Vivado and set up our DDR interface connection between the Zinc and the two DDR3 low power modules. Nicely enough, the Zinc chip itself, here we can see the DDR interface section, has got fixed DDR pins. I won't be going into detail about DDR3 memory, there's plenty of content on the internet if you'd like to delve even deeper. In essence, we have our data signals, or everything started with D, so DQ, DM, and so on, and we have our address, command, and control signals in blue on the right-hand side. The signals on the left, the data signals, we have a 32-bit wired data bus, so going from DQ0 to DQ31, and 16 bits, so for example, DQ0 to DQ15, will go to one of these two memory ICs, and DQ17 to DQ31, another 16 bits, will go to the second memory IC. We then also have some various clock or data strobes and data masks, which also go to the relevant ICs. On the other hand, these address command and control signals, so A0 to A14, on die termination, the bank address pins, row address strobe, column address strobe, and all these various signals have to go to both of the DDR memory chips. And there's several routing strategies to do that. If you move over to the actual DDR3 low power schematic page, we can see the two individual DRAM ICs. We've got U700 and U701. The address command and control signals in blue, again on the left-hand side, are identical for U700 and U701, whereas the data connections are different, as I said before. This brings with it some complications. For the data signals, this is of course fairly straightforward. We go from the Zinc to one memory device. So it's just a point-to-point -point connection. However, the address command control signals in blue have to go from the Zinc to one device then to the next device and finally end in termination resistors and this is for signal integrity purposes. Going to the PCB itself we have the Zinc IC in the middle and we have our two memory ICs on the left hand side. The signals you're seeing on this top layer which I've highlighted are the data signals going point to point to these two ICs and we have a similar strategy on the bottom side. I've tried to route them on same layer transitions and same layers. The memory signals however if we look at the blue traces have to pass one IC, then pass the next IC, and end on termination. And my termination resistors happen to be on the bottom side next to the last memory IC. I won't be going into detail, as I said in this video, but this is what it's known as flyby routing. I'm starting at the Zinc, 
I'm rooting over to my bottom memory I see, which is my first one, then I'm changing layers and rooting to my top one, and finally ending in these termination resistors. The reason I'm telling you this is because we need to account for delays in the system. We have delays from the zinc to the first memory IC in terms of data connections. Then we have delays from the zinc to the DDR3 memory IC at the top. Again, point to point data connections. But then we also have delay from the zinc to the first memory IC to the second memory IC to the termination resistors of the address command and control lines. And this we have to know and know from our ECAD tool and import that in Vivado. But I'll show you how to do that in just a second. I can highly recommend Silinx user guide UG933, which tells you all about the Zinc 7 series with regards to PCB design. Starting from page 57, there's also a section on dynamic memory, talking about what the different signal names mean, what they're used for, and then also how you should be routing them depending on the memory type. As I discussed before, I did a flyby routing, so to starting from the Zinc, address command control routes through both my memory modules and ends with termination resistors on the right hand side. Whereas the data groups, so data group 0, 1, 2, 3, or byte lanes, as they sometimes refer to, are routed point to point between the individual memory ICs. Make sure to check this out in case you need some clarification. We're back in Vivado to enable our DDR3 memory, and then also to input the parameters which are hardware dependent. So depending on how we've done our actual PCB layout, as we just saw, and also what ICs we're using. As you saw from the previous video, we had our block design open with a Zinc 7 processing system. Again, we double click on this. And from last time, we can see we had UART1 enabled, and that's pretty much it. And what we need to do now is go to the DDR configuration on the left hand side. We need to enable DDR, of course, using this checkbox, and then we need to start configuring our DDR controller. So let's open this first tab. The first thing is memory type. As you saw from this page, I've chosen to go with DDR3 low power memory. In this case, it was more for the sake of availability and cost that I could actually get these parts. So we select DDR3 low voltage or DDR3L. Silinx in Vivado includes many different memory parts, which you can choose from, and then Vivado will fill in all of the remaining parameters on its own, depending on what part you chose. Unfortunately, a lot of these parts in Vivado are obsolete. If I had the choice, I would just choose one of these parts, and if it's easy to get, of course, I would use that part in my design to minimize any errors, of course. Unfortunately, I had to choose custom parts. At least that lets us explore what that means and how we then can configure this controller. What we have to do is in memory part, go down to custom. My effective DRAM bus width is how many data pins I'm using for my zinc. That's 16 data lines to the one memory IC and 16 to the other. This means we have an effective total DRAM bus width of 32 bits. Disable error correction for now. Burst length of eight is fine. And we want the maximum clock frequency, which is about 533 megahertz. I'm using an external VREF. As you can see in the schematic, I'm supplying the VREF pins over here. So that's why I can leave this unchecked. Junction temperature, we'll just keep it normal. And then we can move over to memory part configuration. And this is where it starts to get a bit more complicated. For this, we need the data sheet of the device we're using. The device I chose, so each individual IC is this micron memory part. As you can see, it's DDR3 low power. It's got a certain package, 16 bit data bus width, organized in this configuration. And this will be important later on. And it's up to four gigabits per part. Now this is a quite a fast part and the zinc actually can't handle the speed of this. And we'll see that we actually have to run this DDR3 memory slower and basically just the maximum capability that the zinc can do. And here's the relevant data sheet. Going back to Vivado, the DRAM bus width is 16 bits, as we just saw, and the device capacity, as we just saw, is four gigabits or 4096 megabits. Now we need to check out the speed bin. The zinc device we're using, and of course this is device dependent, can only handle these various speed bins. Going to the data sheet, the actual device I'm using here typically has a speed grade of dash 107, which is a data rate of 1866. However, in Vivado, this is not an option. The maximum speed grade is one of these 1600 variants. However, looking at the data sheet, we can see that the speed grade 107, looking at the note number one, is backward compatible to speed 1600 for this CAS latency setting. So we can effectively use the parameters of the lower speed grade. And that's what exactly what we're going to do. The next issue is that we have four different types of 1600. So G, H, J, and K. I've selected K. And the reason being, if, for example, if we go to the DDR3 SDRAM wiki page, looking at DDR3 1600, we can see different types of so G, H, J, K, as we just saw. And what you can see, the only thing that changes are these various timing parameters. What we want is the K variant because we have 11, 11, 11. 
which is exactly what we have here for this specified backward compatible speed grade. Therefore, I've chosen DDR3-1600K. Next, we have to change the bank address count, row address count, and column address count, the number of bits. And this is again taken from the datasheet or from the part itself. The bank address count is easy. It's how many bank address pins we have. We have BA0, BA1, BA2 from our part, so that number is three. The row address and column address count we can take from the datasheet, and this is on page 16. Now there are many different configurations, there's 512 times eight, but the configuration we saw from our part, if you remember, is 256 times 16, which is why we need to look at figure five. Zooming on figure five, we can see we have 18 address registers. However, we have 15 row addresses, three bank addresses, and 10 column. So we need 15 row and 10 column, which is already entered here. Next are the timing parameters we already saw. And for 1600K, again from the data sheet, we have to find our CAS latency, or CL. We have to find our CAS write latency, or CWL. And then these various other timing parameters, row address strobe to column address strobe delay, TRCD, TRP, and so on. And these are fairly straightforward to find on the data sheet if you know where to look. So CL first. First is quite easy, we just have to look on page one. TRCD, TRP, and TCL are all 11. And this is in terms of clock cycles, not in nanoseconds, and this is important, of course. As you can see here, Vivado wants cycles. 11 is CL on the right side, then TRCD is this first number, also 11, and TRP, also in cycles, is 11 as well, which is this number. So we're missing the CAS write latency, and then we're missing these TRC, TRAS, MIN, and TFAW. So the CAS write latency first. In the data sheet, this is a tiny bit hidden. We need to go to the speed bin tables, in particular table 55 for the DDR3L 1600 variant. We've selected a cast latency of 11, and the available option we have then for the cast write latency is eight. The rest is reserved. Therefore, in our cast write latency, we write eight, and now we have to figure out TRC, TRASMIN, and TFAW. TRC and TRASMIN, we also take from the same speed bin table. We can see up here, TRC is 48.75, and this is now in nanoseconds and not in cycles. TRASMIN is also in nanoseconds, which is the minimum value for TRAS, or row address strobe. So that's 35 nanoseconds, and now we have TFAW. TFAW happens to be in table 58. I just did a simple search for TFAW in the data sheet. Again, we need to look at DDR3L 1600, and we find TFAW here. We have two page sizes. We have one kilobyte page size and two kilobyte page size. And these will give us two different numbers. So either 30 nanoseconds or 40 nanoseconds. It turns out we need to go to the top of the data sheet to find out what the page size is. And this depends on the organization of the memory. And our organization is 256 meg times 16. And we can check out this table and that's the page size. So it's two kilobytes. Jumping back to table 58. That means we need to use 40 nanoseconds for this two kilobyte page size for TFAW. Going back to Vivado, we type in 40 nanoseconds and that's it. Now we've entered the parameters depending on the specific IC we used. But remember, we also looked at the actual PCB layout and I said before that we need to take delays into account or at least know them to be able to enter them into Vivado. So let's close the memory part configuration and let's open the training board details. The first section is DRAM training, and we want to turn all of this on. And this essentially enables the Zinc or the DDR memory controller to adjust the delays and timings on the fly and adapt to whatever hardware or PCB it's running on, quite simply speaking. What we have to enter is the DQS to clock delays, as well as the board delays themselves. And we get a little helper text on the right hand side. What's easiest to enter first is the board delays. And these are essentially the average or midpoint delays of our data signals. So what is the average trace delay, including package delays, of our different byte lanes? For example, DQ0 to DQ7 will have an average delay. DQ9 to DQ11 will have an average delay. That's for byte lane 1, for byte lane 2, and for byte lane 3. Those average delays we can find out just by going to the PCB in Altium Designer and looking at the individual traces. If I go to PCB and X signals, I've actually created some X signal classes, which then list the delays themselves. And I've used this to make sure I've matched my delays to with a certain tolerance within the individual byte lanes of byte lane 0, 1, 2, and 3, as well as within, within the address command and control signals. If we look at byte line 0, so that encompasses DQ0 to DQ7, 
And then I just click on one of these traces. On the right hand side, we can see we have a total delay and this is including the package delays of about 200, 201 picoseconds. And that's what I then enter in my DQ7 to zero delay. And that's in nanoseconds, so it's about 0 0.20 nanoseconds, so about 200 picoseconds. If I look at byte lane one, then we have about 230, 231 picoseconds. And that's what I then enter for DQ15 to DQ8. I happen to know that the next one is about 0.21. Then I can continue. The next average delay is 0.21, or so 210 picoseconds. And then again, I have 0.20 picoseconds. So this is pretty straightforward. And again, this depends on your PCB design and layout and your actual delays in the design, board to board dependent, of course. Next, we have the DQS to clock delays. And this is the difference between essentially the data strobe, so simply speaking, the clock signals for the data lines compared to the delay of the address command control signals. If you remember back to the schematic, the address command control signals have their own clock and each byte lane essentially has its own strobe or clock, simply speaking. The address command control clock should be routed longer than any of these DQS or these strobe signals. Therefore, when we do this calculation, we're, we're always going to be taking the long clock signal, subtracting that delay from the delay of the DQS lines. Again, going into Altium Design and my PCB view, I have my X signals, so my grouped signals for my address. And this is going from the zinc to the first memory I see. So if I click on that, it highlights all of these address command control signals. On my average delay is about 430 picoseconds from the zinc to the first memory I see. The combined length, because we're doing flyby routing, so we're first going from the zinc I see to the first memory I see to the second memory I see, we want that whole length for the next I see part. Again, looking at the X signals, the second one, we can see the total length to the second memory I see is about 620 picoseconds on average. So the delay, not the length, is about 620 picoseconds on average from the zinc to the second memory IC. In Vivado, DQS0 and DQS1 belong to one memory IC, DQS2 and DQS3 belong to the other memory IC. Then we take the clock delays of the address command control signals, take them and subtract the relevant DQS delays. I've written this down in my own little sheet here. So it turns out that address to DQ0 is 0 0.419, the next 0 0.389, 0 0.224, and 0 0.229. And that's essentially what I'd enter. You can, of course, round up. It's not going to be accurate to within the picosecond for this example. So I've entered all my data here. And essentially, all I'm following is this helper text on the right hand side and following my PCB layout. Other than that, we don't really have to enable anything else. We've done all the hard work now. We've done the memory part configuration. DDR3 controller configuration and entered our board specific details. All we have to do is then click OK. What we then need to do is simply generate the bitstream. And by clicking generate bitstream on the bottom left, it'll automatically run the synthesis, run implementation, and then we can import that into our IDE. I want to save my project and then I'll start generating the synthesis and implementation. Once the synthesis and implementation runs are complete, we've now generated a bitstream. What we can do is export our hardware files, which we can then use in the VTS IDE as we did in the previous video. So go to the top left file, export, export hardware, include the bitstream, and we can just give this a certain name. So go on set Brett DDR, and then generate these files. Once you've generated the XSA files, we need to go to tools and then launch VTS IDE. Once your VTS IDE is open, as before and in, the pre and in the previous video, we need to create a new example project. And nicely enough, VTS is shipped with a DRAM test project, which checks for any errors in the memory space, checking all the byte lanes, as well as performing eye diagram measurements. The way we can do this is go to the top left file, new application project. Then we need to choose our XSA file we just generated. And I've selected the ZBread URDDR XSA we just generated. Click next. Give it a project name, which is somewhat sensible. So DDR test, for example, we can leave most of this as default. And now we need to select our template or example project. And at the bottom, you can see the zinc DRAM tests, select that and click finish. Once the project has generated, we can go to source and then look at test01.c, which is the main code. And if you'd like to, of course, you can read through it to try and understand what it's doing. For us, we'll just build this project. We don't have to change anything. And it will use the UART1 port we configured in the last video as then a serial output, and we can run tests interactively using that. The build should finish without any errors, and then we need to define a run configuration. The way we can do that is go to the top next to this play button on the drop down, run configurations, and we want to create a single application debug as before, GDB, 
double click, and then we can click run when we're ready. I have one of my Tetbrets now on the board here. As you can see, I've plugged in a micro USB cable, which connects to my FTDI on this board. So this is for USB to UART and USB to JTAG for programming. And I've connected my barrel jack power in, and you can see my board is powered on. With the hardware connected, as we just saw, you can see my FTDI USB to UART converter shows up as port or COM25. So in putty, I'm just gonna type in COM25, and remember I, our UART board rate was 115200, and I'll just open that. Now we're ready in VTIS to click launch. So let's do that, I'll just click run. I'll open up putty in the background. On the bottom right-hand side, you can see we're starting the GDB server, and now we're flashing the FPGA. And nicely enough, through the USB to UART connection, we now get the program running or the program output. So you can see we have quite a few different options here now. We can do general memory tests where we test each byte lane, we test all the address space, and we can start by only looking at one megabyte and all the way to one gigabyte of RAM, which is the amount of RAM we have on this board. We can also see the current temperature of the board, which is at 30 degrees, so I just turn this on. But we can also do read and write eye measurements, which will be useful later on. So let's start off with a simple one megabyte test. I can do that by pressing S on my keyboard. If we scroll up, we can see that we have zero word error counts for this one megabyte address space and zero per byte lane error counts. So that's really promising. We can of course do a larger test, maybe looking at 32 megabytes, which of course will take a tiny bit longer. But the goal here is to verify that we don't have any errors across any of these byte lanes. And that's really important and we can verify our routing this way. When I look at it, 32 megabytes, it looks like we're clear as well. So now let's start the whole memory space test by clicking six, and this tests a gigabyte of our DDR3 memory. So I can start this like so. And now it's running. Of course, this will take a little while. So let's check once this is completed. With the Tetbread board now hooked up, I'm running test number six, which is testing the whole one gigabyte of DDR3 memory that's available on this board. As you can see, it's already been running for some time. So far, no word errors and no per byte lane errors, which is a great sign. I'll pause the video now and we'll see you again once this test has completed. Now the one gigabyte of DDR3 memory test has finished. You can see we've got zero word errors across the whole memory space as well as zero per byte lane errors. That's already a good indication that we've done a good job when routing and laying out this board. We can also see the X80C temperature, so the temperature of the zinc chip itself has increased by 30 degrees, so it's running about 60 degrees now after having done that test, which is of course very much still within reason. The next test we want to look at are the read data I measurement test and the write data I measurement tests. I won't be going into any detail of what an eye diagram is. I'll leave two links in the description below. First of all, to this Texas Instruments video about what an eye direct diagram is. Essentially, it's a tool to measure signal integrity. I'll also leave a link to this video by W2AEW about what is an eye pattern, and he has a nice practical demonstration of how to build one up on an oscilloscope. For DDR memory, of course, this is running at quite a high speed. I don't have the equipment in my personal lab to check this out, but nicely enough, the DRAM test, which is pre-written by Xilinx, includes read and write data I measurements without the need for external equipment. The way we can run this is by pressing R and I, the read data I first, and what's important to us are the final results, and that is the I center and the I width. So we want the I typically centered, which it seems like it is, and in particular the eye width. So typically a, a greater eye width is something preferable to a smaller eye width, and we're getting about 81 and the rest 75% eye width. We can do the same thing for the right data eye by pressing I, and we're gonna have a similar test and similar results. We get different eye widths and eye centers around 70 to 80%, and this is actually pretty good. The question is how we can actually verify that this is any good. We're getting absolute numbers. How does it compare relatively? And nicely enough, Adam Taylor on his blog has performed the same tests on his custom boards as well as boards from Digiland, so pre-made third-party boards. He's run exactly the same tests as we did. And for his board, he also got, you know, 75 to 80% eye width. And then he also compared that to pre-made off-the-shelf boards, for example, from Xilinx or from Digiland. And he found that generally the eye widths are anywhere from 70 to 80% as well, which verifies to me that I've done an okay job at laying out this board and routing the DDR bus. We've had zero byte errors, our eye widths are within a good range and so forth, which is really great because now we can move on and also incorporate this DDR3 memory into future designs and we can use this one gigabyte of memory. 
Now we've looked at and verified the DDR3 memory connection routed as a flyby configuration to the Zinc system on chip. This is really useful because this now enables us to continue the board bring up. We need this external memory, for example, to run embedded Linux to be able to test the EMMC memory and for example, the USB high speed connection, as well as the gigabit ethernet interface. In the next video, I'll show you this QSPI flash memory at the top, which is a non-volatile memory, which we can use to program the Silent Sync rather than always having to rely on a JTAG connection. So we can upload code to the QSPI as well as bootloaders and binaries. And on startup, we can have the QSPI memory program the Zinc. The video after that will then look at Gigabit Ethernet and how we can do a test program, measure the bandwidth and so on. And then we'll look at EMMC memory and the USB high speed. And that pretty much will then conclude the board bring up. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it was useful and I hope it showed you how you can test DDR3 memory on your own custom designs. If you don't want to miss any future board bring up, PCB and hardware design videos, make sure to subscribe to the channel. If you liked the video, please leave a like, a comment if you have any questions, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you. Bye-bye.